Got it. So the first person who's going to come on up, come on up, is a wonderful professor from the Eteha, Manu Kapoor. He was here also and spoke last year. And fortunately, his talk was not a failure. <laughs> <laughs> But we're going to talk about learning from failure. And I think this is going to be a wonderful, wonderful way to start off the day. So, Manu, welcome. Let's give Manu your a homegrown talent. A warm welcome. <coughs> Got it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everyone. No pressure. Now I can't fail. <laughs> But as a good mentor of mine uh, used to tell me, you know, Manu, if you succeed, that's good. If you fail, we just laugh together. So either way, it's all good. So I'm going to, um, well, a little introduction. I'm a learning scientist. But before that, um, uh, I was originally born in India, went to Singapore, spent much of my life there, played f football professionally. That didn't work out. That's why I'm here. Um, <laughs> Became an academic after teaching for a while, spent time in Singapore, New York, Hong Kong, and now finally Zurich. So I hope to stay here for a while. <laughs> We hope oh. you do too. <laughs> Great. Okay, so the thing that I'm going to talk about is productive failure, but as a learning scientist, I'm going to come at it from the point of learning. How do we develop talents for the future? But what does it mean really to design learning environments for that talent development to take place? Uh, so I'm going to start by sharing with you uh, four critical principles derived from the sciences of learning, the research and learning. And then I'm going to share with you an example, a concrete example of a design that helps, that embodies that, those principles to develop the critical competencies that we need uh, in the work of future, or should I say the future of work, either way. Two questions that sort of anchor my research and my work are, I'm particularly interested in how do we come to understand something new. So learning is a long process. Development of expertise is a long process. I'm interested in how do we get to understand something new. Because that's, learning is path dependent. Um, and second question just naturally follows is how do we transfer these understandings to solve novel problems? It's a simple question, but if you think about it, the whole point of learning is not just to be able to solve problems uh, that you're trained for, but also to be able to flexibly adapt and solve novel problems that require creativity, innovation, and so on. So how do we design that learning experience that students both understand and transfer? Um, and that is a big challenge. So I'm going to go into the four principles now. And I've set it up as provocations or tensions for us to think about. And so the first one is what I refer to as seeing versus encoding. So let me, let's have a thought experiment. Suppose you are watching a football match. Um, my name is Manu, so I suppose I support Manu. <laughs> <laughs> suppose sitting next to you is uh, Sir Alex Ferguson or Mourinho now. Um, and you watch a really entertaining, engaging match, let's say Manchester United won. And after the match, if you were to ask, if I were to ask you, well, did you see the same match as the coach? Hmm. Chances are yes, yes. or no? Yes. Yeah. Right, so what is that? So I want to focus on that difference. You did see the same stimuli, the perceptual stimuli were the same, but decades of research and expert novice literature suggest that experts see very different things from novices. Hmm. Novices do not even know that they're missing out on certain things hmm. because seeing or noticing is not just a perceptual exercise, it's a cognitive one. Now, you can be an expert in, this, in the learning situation. You, have, you need experts to teach novices. And you can have the most fascinating, engaging presentation, a MOOC or a PowerPoint presentation, but you're still making the assumption that the novices that you're teaching are seeing what you're seeing. And that is a flawed assumption. Hmm. So the first principle is very simple and has profound implications. That is, if you want to teach somebody as an expert, the first job is really not to teach. The first job is helping them or preparing them to see what you want them to show, uh, to see, and then show them. So that's a very basic principle in cognitive science, the principle of seeing versus encoding. Uh, the next one is sort of builds on that, and this is the distinction between knowing versus doing. So what do you have here? It's a carpenter working with an apprentice, probably his son or daughter. Now imagine if the carpenter back in the day, or even today, said, look, son, you've got to learn some mathematics first. You've got to know your numbers, you've got to know your geometry and angles, 
and you've got to pass a course on that. And then you also need some physics. You need to know your forces and mechanics and so on, and material science because you're working with different kinds of materials. Oh, by the way, you also need a course in communication skills because you need to talk to customers and so on. And once you've done all that, pass some contrived tests in resource-poor environments that have no sense, that have no relation to the real world, then I will take you as certified and you can come to the shed and we can do some carpenting. Hmm. But if you think about it, that's what we do right now. We have taken the knowing, the knowledge about carpenting and divorced it from the doing of the carpenting. Part of the problems that we have in modern education, right through schooling and higher education, is a problem that we ourselves have created because we've divorced knowing about something from the doing mm. of that thing. And we've also we almost followed the mantra that know first, do later. And that is simply flawed because knowing is best conceived as situated in the doing. So the starting point of designing learning is not to ask the question, what does the person need to know? The starting point has to be, what does the person need to do? Mm. So if you're training engineers, lawyers, doctors, the question is, what do these engineers, lawyers, doctors do? And then situate the knowing of that discipline, the knowledge in that discipline, in the practices of that discipline. I'll mm. illustrate this point later, right? But as long as we continue this knowledge first or knowing first and doing later, we are just perpetuating the problem. And decades of research, again, on transfer suggests that we will not be able to solve it because transfer in this way of thinking is very rare and research mm. supports that. A corollary of this is this notion of this idea about creativity. Again, here the mantra is, well, you need some knowledge first before you can be creative with it. Of course, you, you need to solve problems in a domain. You have to have the knowledge in that domain. So let's do a thought experiment here. Suppose we are all kids and we all love to play with toys. Suppose one half of you, I say, hey, I've got a toy. Let me show you how to play with it. Do you want to play with it? I know it's a Saturday morning. It's hard to pretend to be a kid. <laughs> just humor me. All right, so you want to play with it. I'm going to show you how to play with it. And I show you how to play with it. Here, take this toy. Go play with it and I'll observe you. And to this half, I say, well, I've got a toy. Do you want to play with it? Yes. Thank you. Play with it. And then I observe you, the two groups. Mm. Who do you think is more inventive with it, more creative with it? Yeah. Come on, make a punt. I want some hands. All right, everybody here thinks they're going to be. <laughs> what <about> you guys? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, think of knowledge as a conceptual toy. What we want our students to learn is to play with not just tangible toys as kids naturally play with it and be creative with it. We want the knowledge to be a conceptual toy. We want our students to learn and play with concepts and knowledge because that's where creativity is. So again, the idea the knowledge first, then creative use is flawed. You've got to somehow situate the learning of new things in a creative enterprise. And I'll show you an example of how that is done. The final tension is the incommensurability between learning versus performance. We often conflate the two, so it's useful to step back and separate, disambiguate learning from performance. Sometimes we have high learning, low learning, I'm just dichotomizing it, and same for performance, low versus high. Sometimes there is low performance, but high learning. You're trying to tinker and play with something, you're developing deep understandings, deep learning is going on, but the performance is still not there. And that's what I called productive failure, and that's the research that I focus on. Other times, you've got all the tools and resources in the world, you're performing well, and you're also learning well, and that's productive success. These two are fine. We don't want unproductive failure, which is the case where there's no learning and no performance. Giving novices no support and getting, helping them, or oh, letting them to figure out things on their own rarely succeeds. So that's pure discovery. It rarely succeeds in a learning situation. So that's unproductive failure. But by far, the most dangerous beast in this quadrant is unproductive success. And that is the illusion of learning in high performance. Hmm. And I will go out on a limb, and I think you will agree that this is the one thing that most of our schooling and learning experiences suffer from. 
right? Unproductive success. That's what we don't want. So I've shared with you these four themes about seeing, about knowing versus doing, about knowledge and creativity, and disambiguated learning versus performance. How does it all come together into a concrete example? So if you, if you want to embody these principles into the design of learning environments, how do we do that? So that's where I shift into the second part, and that is about productive failure. It's a particular way of designing learning. I, I will not go into all the principles of it, but just give you a taste of it. And the idea was back in, in my doctoral days, and I, everybody was talking about learning from failure, learning from mistakes. There are lots of gurus who talk about it as well. I thought, well, if everybody's talking about it, there must be something in it. And, um, and if learning from failure is so intuitive, why don't we just, why do we wait for it to happen? Why don't we design it? Why don't we test it? Why don't we build the science behind the si learning from failure? What would that look like? And it just turns out that that simple question branched off a research program, which retrospectively, when I look back, embodies those principles. So no, my thinking was not as linear as I'm presenting it. It was kind of complex and nonlinear. But let's see. So I'm going to give you a concrete example of how productive failure unfolds in a math classroom. Okay, just to give you a sense of what happens. Suppose you're 14 or 15 year old, uh, now instead of being kids, now you're 14, 15 year old students in a math classroom. You're learning the concept of standard deviation. I think I'm sufficiently, I can assume that everybody here knows the concept of standard deviation. We are at ETH after all. Um, but these are kids, they don't know this concept yet. And the typical way of teaching this concept, whether it's in school or in, a, in higher education settings, the lecturer will come in, the expert will come in and give a lecture on standard deviation, take you through lots of examples, practice, and so on and so forth. In productive failure, we start with, well, we've got to embody those principles. So we say, hey, here's some data on football strikers, Dave, uh, Mike, and Ivan, and here's the number of goals they've scored over a number of years. Your job is to invent as many ways of deciding who's the most consistent of them all. So it's nothing to do with standard deviation. We're just throwing them out. They don't know the concept. They don't even know such a concept exists. But this is the job. Here's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, as much time as you have. Invent as many ways. What do you think they'll do? Not a rhetorical question. <laughs> Average. The average, yeah. The sum. Max min. The sum. Highest and lowest goals. Highest and lowest goals. Or well, the maximum and minimum. Yeah? Year difference. Sorry? Year to year difference. Year to year difference, that's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's speaking like a novice. Mm -hmm. As in, <laughs> thinking like a novice. That's very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, counting above and below a certain threshold. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you very much, yes. <laughs> Students often dis uh, ambiguate, sorry, uh, consistency with being good. So you have to tell them a straight F student is bloody consistent, as consistent as a straight A student. <laughs> right. Okay, so I'm going to show, show you what students actually do. This is uh, years and years of, years of research, and these are some of the typical examples that come out from Singapore. Um, at least. So they do take averages. Some, some of them know median and modes. And so one of the things we've done is we, the, the design invites or activates the knowledge that's necessary to solve the problem, but the problem is designed in a way that that makes it unsolvable. So we keep it invariant. So they reach, they, they try to solve something, but it doesn't work. They try to tally scores, um, and then they can argue qualitatively that, oh, uh, you know, Ivan Wright is either very good or very bad, the third fellow, and the middle one is more bunched up. They draw frequency polygons and so on and so forth. The things that they've learned, the formal knowledge that they've learned in classrooms. And they're arguing qualitatively about who's the more consistent. They draw graphs. I'm surprised nobody mentioned graphs, but I'm sure you're thinking about it. It's like up and down. So you ask them, what's going on here? And they say, oh, if it goes up and down a lot, it's more inconsistent. But if it doesn't change with the same gestures, it, it's more consistent. I said, okay, if you had 100 players, are you going to do 100 times? Or can you be more quanti quanti Can you, like a mathematician, quantify it? Be more precise about it? So, okay. They do take range, but we've kept it the same. It's the evil side of productive failure. It invites you and throws you a hurdle. And then I think somebody mentioned year and year deviation. So, this is what they do, like a stock market. And they add all the deviations year and year. And the lower the total, 
the more consistent. Again, you won't find this in a textbook in mathematics or statistics, but it happens a lot of the time. <laughs> Some of them realize that, well, you know, the positive and negative fluctuations cancel out, which is not fair. And so they ignore the signs. So and they take the average fluctuation in the graph. Right? Look, these kids do not know the concept of standard deviation just yet. Right? Very rarely do you get deviations from the mean, which all of you know is the starting point of calculating standard deviation. But if you do it this way, it adds up to zero, and they're back to square one. Yep. Mm. And interesting things happen. Not that the rest of it was not interesting. Sometimes really interesting stuff happens. And this is the group that was challenged to quantify their graph. They said, OK, imagine um, if I could hold the ends of the graph and I could somehow stretch it into the rope. Hmm. And if, what if we could calculate the length of this rope? And the longer the rope, the more it deviates. inconsistent, inconsistent. the spiker would be. And so they'd heard of this chap called Pythagoras, who'd be very happy. And they've converted uh, the <laughs> graph into right angle triangles, calculated the hypotenuses, added them all up. And that's the length on the right-hand side. Now, to this day, I've never bothered. This is 10 years of work, or more, rather. I've never bothered to check this calculation. <laughs> <laughs> For a very simple reason. The real mathematics, the mathematics here is not in the computation. The mathematics here is in the play of imagination. It's the creativity. And it's all happening, think about it, before the teacher or the expert has even shared anything. Right? So if you step out of this concrete example, you go back to the four principles. <coughs> Excuse me. Think about how an experience like this helps students see. Having generated these ideas, not all of them are optimal. Some of them don't work at all. But how it prepares them to see what an expert might want to show them after this. How their knowledge about mathematics is both getting activated, but also being situated in not schooling, but actual doing of mathematics. They're not just learning about mathematics. They're doing mathematics just like engineers might do engineering or practice engineering and so on and so forth. So the, this divide between knowing versus doing is being sort of bridged, and knowing is appropriately situated in the discipline of mathematics rather than the discipline of schooling. Knowledge versus creativity. Yeah. We are not waiting for creativity to happen later on. We are designing for creative processes from the get-go while we are from the very beginning. I mean, the idea that they need to learn something first and then be creative with it is, like I said, is a flawed one. You have to design for creative practices while learning even very simple concepts, right? And finally, learning versus performance. There is deep learning going on even though, even as kids are tinkering, playing with this knowledge and developing ideas. And that's what I call productive failure. I haven't shared with you the actual imp 